a very good morning to all of you. Uh, in the interest of time, since Dr. Pooja is slightly delayed, uh, I'll be starting with my talk on intracorneal ring segments in keratoconus. Now, just to place things in context, we know that C3R can stabilize a keratocodic cornea, and once you have a stable cornea, we now look at the second stage of visually rehabilitating these patients through refractive beans. Um, contact lenses remain the simplest and perhaps one of the best modalities for patients with KC. However, there are patients who are intolerant to contact lenses, and we have three main modalities of topo-guided PRK, phacic IOLs, and intracorneal ring segments for these patients. Now, when we have a central cone with a low degree of refractive error, morning, morning sir. A central cone with a low degree of refractive error can be treated with a topo PRK, classically for mild to moderate cases. A central cone with a higher amount of refractive error can be treated with a phacic IOL. Now, the eccentric cone, which basically means that the keratoconic cornea has a high degree of irregularity, needs some regularization. Regularization of such an eccentric cone and moderate keratoconus is best done with an intracorneal ring segment. I'll just be telling you about these are and how they are to be used. Now, ICRS are basically tiny arcs of PMMA. They are implanted in the corneal stroma. What happens when you implant them is that they function as a spacer device. What does a spacer device do? You can just imagine a hammock or a tightly stretched curved rope. If you put in two, two spacer devices, what will hap, 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 happen to the tension across the hammock? It will become less tense, it will have less stress on it, and the central portion will become flatter. So what is an ICRS doing? It is basically flattening the central area, and it is also redistributing the biomechanical stress forces. So in effect, we have three outcomes. The cornea becomes more regular. The central area becomes flatter. Therefore, the refractive error reduces. The vision improves. And the third important factor is because of the redistribution of biomechanical stress forces, it adds value to stopping the progression of keratoconus. So who are the patients who are fit for ICRS? Classically, we do it in patients with a visual acuity with spectacles best corrected worse than 6 9 because ICRS is not pure mathematics. If you do it in a 6-6 spectacle corrected patient, they may actually get a little bit of disturbance because when an eccentric cone becomes central, sometimes a 6-6 patient uh, with spectacles may feel that the aberrations have increased. So classically take patients with visual acuity worse than 6-9 with spectacles who have clear central corneas and the paracentral and peripheral cornea, which is between the 6 to 8 mm zone, where the ICRS will be implanted should be at least 400 to 450 microns thick. Now you may think this is a high thickness, but do note this is not a central thickness. So a lot of patients with keratoconus will be eligible for this because in this area you may have a thick enough cornea. There are various segments that are available. We commonly use the intact segment, but the cost has come down with the biotech company introducing a segment of bio ring, you also have Ferrera rings. What is important to note in this is that basically the cross section of these segments are different. They are done in a way that the negative photopsias associated with a segment implanted close to the pupil are reduced and whenever you implant anything in the stroma, the forward compression of the stroma as well as the endothelial pressure is minimized using a cross section of the base their, bases their research. The preoperative plan of ICRS is akin to what you would do for most keratoconus patients, a good topography and a good refraction. Now do note that the, this will influence the segments that you use and how you implant. What, are, what is the thickness of the segment that you will use will depend on the amount of correction that you need. So if you are treating a steeper cornea or if you are treating a cornea which is uh, high in terms of the spherical equivalent, right? These are both indicators of how advanced the keratoconus is. You will need to flatten it more. So you will use a thicker segment. 
Now, if you have a central cone, you will flatten it symmetrically because you want the whole cornea to be pushed down, but you don't need to displace it. So you will use two similar sized segments or symmetric segments. If you have an asymmetric cone, you will use one thick segment on the portion where the, uh, where the cone is larger. For example, largely it is an inforotemporal cone, so the inferior segment will be thicker. Uh, another way of defining symmetric or asymmetric, first is you use the refraction. If the sphere is more than the cylinder, it is a symmetric cone, but the cylinder has to be looked at in a positive connotation. So you transpose so that the cylinder is positive and then see whether you need symmetric or asymmetric. Or you look at the topography. If large part of the cone is outside the 3 to 5 mm zone on the posterior float, okay? So then it is an asymmetric segment that you will go for. Surgically, do implant it at least at a depth of 70%, because if it is too superficial, the forward uh, compression on the stroma and the epithelial breakdown may lead to extrusion. Also, a deeper implantation will give you a better effect. Now, uh, earlier, the implantation was done manually, but now we have good femtosecond laser platforms, which allow us to create a channel which uh, is made as per the desired diameter and depth. Once this is pre-fashioned, we simply open, the, open up the channel with blunt instrumentation. You can sometimes even use the ICRS ring, but I prefer this instrument, which first goes vertically, and then you uh, turn it into the channel. And... Uh, Following this, you will nudge the ICRS segments into their place. So this is how you hold. There are special forceps to hold the ICRS segments. So there is first a small vertical dip followed by the circumferential movement along the channel. Do note that there are two tiny holes at each of the ends. You can engage them with a Sinsky hook and this is important because the distal end of the ICRS must be at least 1 to 2 mm away from the incision site. Otherwise, you again risk extrusion. This is the second segment being implanted. I'll just be discussing a few cases. This is the first case. Now, you can see the cone here is within the 3 to 5 mm zone. This is in the posterior float. If you see the refraction, it, if it's transposed into the positive sense, the sphere is more than the cylinder. So you go for symmetric segments. This is what we have done in this case. The axis is chosen as the steep axis, like you do in a cataract surgery. The steep axis can be defined either by your topography or refraction. Normally, because you're treating the refraction, we take the steep axis as the refraction to override the topographic steep axis. If they coincide, well and good. Otherwise, you go for the refractive steep axis. If, however, the keratoconus is too advanced for you to feel that you are bang on on the axis, because there's a lot of scissoring, and you're unsure about the axis, you may tilt towards the topographic axis. So this is what we have done. You see here that this is, uh, note here that the ICRS is put inside about 1 to 2 mm, inside the incision to avoid extrusion. And you also don't make the two segments touch each other. Because in case they're touching each other, they will have a torque and they may bend forward. So keep a distance between both the segments. This is the comparison map just to show you that these segments do give you a real improvement in topography and in BCVA. This is the second case. You see this is more of an eccentric cone and you will put in a thicker segment inferiorly. You may or may not choose to put a thinner segment superiorly. All these things, you can uh, get the initial plan from the company and basis your experience, tweak the plan. But for beginners, the plan that the company sends is a reasonable plan, and you can reach out to one of your colleagues for further added inputs. So uh, we normally uh, tend to do cross-thinking along with ICRS on the same sitting. You, if you have to do sequentially, then please do the ICRS first, regularize the cornea, and then do the cross-thinking to freeze the regularized cornea, right? There is, of course, an advantage of doing a single sitting of the fact that not only do you save the patient a visit, but also the riboflavin dye pools into the ICRS channels. And the cross-thinking of the channels enhances the effect of the ICRS itself. 
This is just a very important take home point. This is a lady who came to us with post classic ectasia. You see this is what she had. This is the cross thinking being done because progression was evident. And this is the progression post the second pregnancy. So cross thinking often is not as effective in post classic ectasia. This is our other eye. You see again there's a central nipple like protrusion which is a post classic ectasia um, central uh, uh, you know a steep island a steep uh, uh, steepening followed by the island that you see from the ablation we did an icrs in this patient the second eye first eye was pure cross linking this is icrs and this is how she was in her second pregnancy so this is the first eye with just cross linking and it has worsened okay so this is the second eye of the same patient with ICRS, which is actually better. So this really goes to prove that ICRS is a very important modality in post classic ectasia, and it has an additional role of redistribution of the biomechanical stress forces, which reduces the progression of ectatic corneal disorders. I'll just show you that ICRS can sometimes al always have complications, like a reaction or an extrusion. This is a belt. If you have a corneal melt, cornea will never epithelize over the PMMA segment. So you will need to take out the ICRS. You can prevent it by really treating with steroids any initial inflammation, particularly the VKC associated with these patients, so that it doesn't progress to this. But in case it has, you have to remove the segment. Cornea is a very forgiving tissue, and usually it does heal back with no significant long-term damage. This is what I was talking about. Sometimes these melts are preceded by white cell reactions. So treat the corneal surface, respect the corneal surface before doing any procedure like an additive surgery. Where you, This is again another melt. This was during the COVID lockdown. And uh, I did not have access. It's right in the center. If the melt is in the distal end, you can simply hook it out and take it out. In case the melt is in the center, I'm going to make a de-roofing T incision because you have to access the ICRS through the small holes in the distal and proximal ends. Then you engage it and simply wheel it out. So this is the wheeling out of the ICRS segments. And uh, the cornea subsequently does epithelize. I think we are blessed with one of the best tissues in the eye, and this is the healing process that has happened. Some of the effect of the ICRS still maintains if it's been in the eye for many years because there has been a scarring along it. So all in all, ICRS is a very useful modality in the treatment of keratoconus and post classic ectasia. Complications, though, can be there if identified and treated well. Do not leave any dangerous sequelae. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ritika. It was a <coughs> wonderful presentation. We all know keratoconus is a disease uh, which is progressive and sometimes very difficult to manage to give a very nice optical rehabilitation. In a selected cases, uh, different procedure will uh, apply and they can give you a good outcome also. And intracornal ring, ring segment has been there for a quite a long time. and. Uh, they will uh, also give a suitable outcome for our patient in a selected case, which uh, Dr. Ritika nicely showed, which are those cases where you'll have a benefit of IC, uh, ICLS and the outcome. And two or three things are important here, which uh, may be important in terms of patient counseling also. One is it's going to improve the quality of vision, which may be with the uh, segment itself in a low to moderate cases or the subsequent rehabilitation with uh, spectacles or a contact lens will be better. In fact, many indications may be uh, for improving the contact lens fit in those cases. Other thing is, as she rightly showed, if there is a small uh, case, number of cases where complication occurs, it's a reversible procedure. Therefore, you can take it out and do other procedures also. You can do a dark procedure if needed, you can do other procedures also. Still, you have a patient's own cornea still there, preserved. The third thing is you can combine that with the cross-linking so that your effect is uh, uh, more prominent and lasts for longer time also. So there are two or three things are very, very important in these cases. As far as uh, segments are concerned, she nicely showed that you can use a symmetrical segment, asymmetric segments. If you are using the asymmetric seg segment in terms of thickness and size, so you should put a you know, thinner one first 
or you push a thicker one first, then go for thinner later because cornea gets stressed and uh, difficult to insert the thicker one subsequently. And make sure uh, you do it in a manner where things are more visible. So sometimes things can be very, very difficult and whatever we have seen, the complications are very, very few with experienced hands and it's a very good alternative for a patient with uh, mild to moderate keratoconus. Thank you, Aritika. Beautiful presentation. Any comments? Can you exchange uh, ICR segment? Ah, it can be exchanged also, yes. And what about CARES? Any? Kera? That's another option people are propagating. You can use the you know, uh, segments prepared from the human tissue, or which uh, may be working in some patient, but you require a large number of cases to really say that it is effective to all type of cases. And whatever cases we have seen from Sujan and the other, they have done really well, except for some cases where there's a <coughs> continuous haze happening. Luckily, they are in a peripheral area, so may not cause a significant damage to visual axis. And uh, but they are also can be removed also, though they become thinner and uh, you know, gets to the stoma also. But I've seen a haze, especially in the, those segments, because this is actually the you know, uh, yeah. tissue which is not the uh, auto tissue. You know. Amit? Just a short comment, like, uh, no doubt that intact is a part of, I mean, uh, the ring segments are a part of what we practice for keratoconus. What visual complications do your patients face? Uh, the, because that's uh, something which sometimes we have to counsel the patient and... Uh, Sir, actually, visually, uh, refractive outcomes are usually, they always get better. There are two problems that actually sometimes come in. I feel contact lens fitting becomes a little tougher post index rather than becoming simpler because the geometry of the cornea changes. Second is that if a patient has very, very good vision and you're doing a early case, the eccentric cone coming into the center adds to the aberrations in the pupillary area and the quality of vision goes down. Hence, I classically don't advise intacts if the patient has good vision with spectacles of 6'9 or better. The third thing is that it is very important in India, a lot of people hide their disease and ICRS segment actually is very yes. visible. So that has to be told to the patient that people will look at your eye and will be able to make out that a procedure has been done. And there are some people who op opt out. I feel I always give a contact lens trial to the patient. They have to say no to move on to the ICRS. Patients who have unilateral keratoconus take to ICRS very well because they never put contact lens because they see with the other eye. So these are the basic uh, things. Yes, correct. Because and we say contact lens intolerant, but you know sometimes we are pushed by the patients also yes. because they come, they read about it, and they come to us. My but second, there are there are no significant uh, photopic uh, or dysphotopsias that these patients are coming to us with. I have one patient who feels that after the explant there is some scarring, so he says that he is not able to drive as well at night. And to overcome them, you can do contact lens fitting on these patients if they are complaining. Yes, and you give it time, so most yes. of them get used to they it. Used to get, and you anyway treat <laughs> patients who have poorer vision. So they anyway have the ghosting and the problems. So they will not complain. It's not like LASIK that they had perfect vision to start with. Uh, and uh, what is your experience with patients where you sometimes might have uh, put in, in uh, some implants after they have undergone cross-linking? So there were two the things. The usual practices, yeah. you know. First is that the femto sometimes actually misfired for us because I think uh, that that one case I didn't show today of a perforation. So the femto channel because of the e uh, that the earlier femtos were a little more sensitive and not as well focused perhaps. Now I don't think we have that problem. So post CXL the dissection is a little more tedious is what we thought but it is not so much because CXL effect is usually in the top part of the stroma and you are going in the deeper part of the stroma. Though the overall effect of the ICRS is a little less post CXL. So you can actually go one segment thicker. But whenever you go a segment thicker, you must not be more than 50% of the stroma because you can melt. And uh, some of the melts that I showed are actually post CXL patients. So please don't think that if they've had CXL, they can't melt. They still can melt because if the ocular surface is bad. Thank you. Okay. Very nice points. Uh, one thing, you know, uh, the suture we put in uh, incision, that should be managed appropriately also. Sometimes if you leave the suture, that 
as such will incite the inflammation vascularization and start melting and you have a problem so suture is also should be managed effectively in these cases earlier when we used to do a manual surgeries depth was a major concern you know but we never achieved the depth where actually you could implant the intact in a proper manner now with the femtosecond you are in an appropriate depth and results are more consistent and predictable thank you uh, ritika let's go to the next talk uh, by dr pooja she is going to take us through the surface management and abrasions in keratoconus Thank Welcome, you, Pooja. Thank you, sir. So I would like to thank uh, Tithyal sir, Manpreet, uh, Praful, and the entire AIS team for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk. So I'm going, uh, I'm going to be talking about lasers in keratoconus. Do they have a role, and what is the impact on higher order aberrations? So uh, there is a very simplified nomogram of how do you go about with uh, a keratoconus patient when it walks into your clinic. When do you pro observe? When do you uh, do a cross linking? And if you are doing a cross linking, when do you do a topo guided cross linking? Epi on, epi off or as uh, Ritika ma'am mentioned uh, ICRS or when do you do a keratoplasty. So the first criteria which would come is if your corneal, uh, you do a topo guided uh, PRK for cross linking only if your corneal thickness is more than 450 and if it's an early or moderate disease. If it's an advanced disease try avoid or if it's a corneal thickness less than 450 please do not uh, go ahead and do a topo guided PRK because it's already a weaker cornea it will make it more weaker. And uh, this is a simplified nomogram, how we uh, apply for cross-linking. If there is a progression, if your visual acuity is good, uncorrected and best corrected, if the patient is, is okay with contact lenses, if the aberrations are very well controlled and the quality of vision is good, you just go ahead and do a manual cross-linking. But when does a, a topo-guided PRK or a laser-based cross-linking comes into picture is when your uncorrected visual acuity and best corrected visual acuity are less. That would be less than 618 or 69 respectively. If the patient is contact lens intolerant or if the aberrations, the higher order aberrations, the coma, the trifolds are on the higher side or if the patient is not happy with the quality of vision with glasses and of course it's a contact lens intolerant patient, then you uh, go ahead and do a uh, topo-guided uh, PRK with cross-linking or a laser-based cross-linking. Now, how do you choose what to do there? You then divide between a centered cone and a decentered cone. If it's a centered cone, you see the pachymetry. If the pachymetry is good, you go ahead with a T uh, CAT procedure. But if it's a decentered cone, then uh, Ritika Mama has already explained that you go ahead and do an intact along with uh, cross linking. So, what are the benefits of uh, uh, when do you do a laser based cross linking? Again, a uh, poor vision, poor uh, contact lens fit, increased aberrations. And when you do a T CAT, it makes your cornea much more regular. The sphericity is very well controlled. So that is why your uh, best corrected visual acuity would be better. There, uh, because of the regularization of the surface, there would be an improved contact lens fit. And as the aberrations will also reduce, the quality of vision after surgery will improve. So that's when TCAT comes into play. And it's not, uh, so you have to be but very clear here. When you are explaining your patients a laser-based cross-linking, a laser-based procedure, you have to tell them that the aim here is not, that the refractive error is not completely going to go away. The aim here is not to completely reduce the refractive error, but to regularize the surface and take care of the aberration. So post-surgery, your quality of vision will be good. And as the surface is regular, the contact lens will be good, uh, fit will be good. So you have to explain the patient very clearly why are you doing a laser-based cross-linking, because otherwise they'll have unrealistic expectations and they'll be like, after surgery, they'll be like, why do I have glasses? Why do I have to wear contact lenses? So you have to be very uh, clear here. And uh, this is what happens. So there are various options which we have. We have various platforms. The most commonly being used are the Wavelight and the Schwinn platform. In Wavelight, you can do a TPRK, which is also known as Athens Protocol, and the PTK, which is known as Cretans Protocol. So what is Athens uh, Protocol? It's nothing but a PRK. Uh, you get these two types of scenario. One is a decentered cone and a centered cone, and you can have a high, uh, mixed astigmatism or a myopia with cylinder. Now, always do a zero rule. Always feed in the refraction as zero and see what is the center and the maximum ablation. And based on the center and maximum ablation, you decide whether to go ahead with it or not. If on zero refraction only, if your uh, ablation is beyond 40 microns, then this would not be the right case for doing a topo guided PRK. A topo guided PRK should always be cut off at 40 to 45 microns of ablation, irrespective of what your corneal thickness is. Even if your corneal thickness is a 500, sometimes don't go beyond 40 microns would be the key factor here. And uh, then you see the 
difference between the central and periphery because if there is a difference, if the center is 25 and the peripheral is 57, you can see there is a difference of 25 uh, microns. This is going to induce a myopia. So whenever it induces a myopia, this patient already has plus 3 and this 25 microns is going to compensate for around 2 diopters. So you will uh, plan your treatment accordingly and uh, only this is already compensated. So here you are only going to treat cylinder. But if you have a myopic, uh, this is what the post-operative -op outcome would be. But if you have a myopic patient and this is what your ablation here is. The center is 12 and the peripheral is 29. The difference is hardly less than 10 microns. So this is not going to induce much of myopia. It is not going to induce like a minus 1 or minus 2 diopters also because every micron uh, it needs 12 mic every uh, diopter it needs 12 micron of ablation. So here the difference between the peripheral and central ablation is less than 10 diopters. So it's not going to induce any uh, myopic error correction. So here you will treat both the sphere and cylinder. Um, uh, keeping in mind that you shouldn't go beyond 30 to 40 percent of sphere, 40 percent of cylinder or uh, if you are uh, or the corneal th uh, uh, the the uh, ablation should not be beyond uh, 40 micron. Uh, so that is what you would do. So let's see a case example in wave light. This is how the uh, workflow is. You do a topolizer, you do the scan quality check and then you export the data to the refractive platform and then you plan the treatment. So this is how the planning looks like. You go to the topo guided mode, you see the quality of scans, you see the Q value. Q value has to be uh, between 0 to minus 1 otherwise the machine doesn't let you go beyond. Then you enter the refraction. But then, the, and this would what it would show as, you do not treat the entire refraction here. You put the 0, 0 refraction and see what is the center and peripheral going to be. Uh, here the difference between the myopic and the uh, hyperopic ablation is 20 microns. So as mentioned before, it's going to induce a myopia of 1.5 diopters. So we will treat 30% of myopia and 30 to 40% of cylinder here and this is what the treatment is going to be like. And this is how the uh, post-op outcome looks like. So this is how you plan on an Alcon platform. But if you have a Schwinn platform, what you do? Again, uh, this planning here is going to be different. Uh, you export the scans, as in sorry, you import the, import the scans from Cirrus platform and you go to the uh, PRK mode and do a 0, 0 refraction and see what is the minimum ablation on 0, 0. Here uh, you have an added advantage here that here you can customize the aberrations. These are how the aberrations look like. Traditionally, the machine is going to treat all the aberrations. But in Schwinn machine, you can customize the aberration by using a depth minimize. It has an AI based algorithm where you, if you click on the depth minimize, the machine will choose which aberrations to correct and which aberrations not to correct. So whatever aberrations are on the higher side, it's going to correct it and whatever aberrations are on the lower side, it is going to leave it alone. Now why is it important or why will this be useful is whenever you treat any aberrations, it burns certain amount of uh, certain microns of cornea. So if you customize the aberration, if you choose like I want to treat particular aberrations and not the uh, entire aberrations, it will reduce the amount of tissue being burned with the laser. So this comes into a very uh, important like step when it, you are dealing with keratoconus uh, patients because you do want to save the tissue as much as possible. So that is why you can customize the aberrations here which one to treat and which one not to treat. And it also, as mentioned here, from 89 microns, it came down to 45 microns. And now I can go ahead and do a treatment. If it was 86, I couldn't have done the treatment. But now it's come down, I can go ahead and done a, do a topo guided treatment. So this is how the Schwinn platform uh, comes into uh, picture, and this is how we treat. But the question comes here is, I'm oh, sorry, what if, in spite of doing all this, the ablation is still on the higher side? Even if you have done a depth minimize, even if you have chosen the aberrations and all, what do you do? So we have a technique where you can customize the PTK only on the cone area and you can only burn 20 microns of stromal tissue in the cone area and uh, regularize the surface. So it's a called a customized PTK. So you go to the PTK cam mode and you measure the dimensions of the cone, the vertical and the horizontal diameter and you see where if the cone is centered or decentered. If the cone is decentered, then you uh, find out how decentered it is uh, from the center of the pupil and then you take all the parameters and feed it into the fl platform here the PTK cam mode platform here and uh, this is uh, you could see the topography that it was a decentered cone and uh, this is what it's going to burn 
so when the cornea is a thinner when or when the ablation is on the higher side but you still want to regularize the surface uh, a customized ptk which is also known as trek can come into picture and it help it can help into regularization of the surface and it can uh, help us in achieving a decent uh, flattening as well so these are the options which we have available uh, for us which helps us not only to regularize the surface to reduce the refractive error to uh, have a better contact lens fit a better quality of vision uh, after surgery uh, while con controlling the ablations thank you puja really a nice uh, overview of the entire uh, tcat uh, just one concern if you are going to be ablating over the cone itself would you not be making it more thin and the irregularity more pronounced because of the difference in the forces now acting upon it? So ma'am, we had the same concern that if we are burning the cone area, especially uh, like on the weakest area, it is going to make it steeper. So uh, when we devised this technique, what we had done was we have uh, done uh, studies like on biomechanics, where we have done the pre and post uh, stress strain index. We have done the pre and post uh, uh, detailed biomechanics with our uh, wavefront model with our scientists. And we have also done some work on collagen imaging where we have seen how the collagen behaves before and after this TREK procedure. So with all these procedures, uh, we have seen that it does remain stable. It does not make your cornea excessively weaker after surgery or it does not induce weakening. And now we have data. So we started this technique in 2017. So now we are in 2023 and we are going to publish five year data of how stable it is. So like other cross-linking cases, there are chances of progression, but the incidence of progression with manual cross-linking or a topo guided cross-linking and TREK uh, is similar. So it's not making, at five years we do know that it's not making the cornea weaker. Also now there are cross-linking uh, possibility of only the cone, so you could maybe combine it with that and yes, it will make it more stable. Yeah, so, but I still, we, in spite of doing this, we would still prefer that along with the cone area, the uh, surrounding area can also be diseased. And we do not have proof right now about how much disease the surrounding cornea is going to be. So till we have the proof of it, better to manually remove the epithelium surrounding and do a cross-linking. Dr. Pooja, that was a wonderful talk. Uh, do you routinely combine all these PTKs with CXL? All the times. All the time, same sitting. <coughs> Nowadays, you know, most of the physicians, they do CXL. So uh, is there any difference when you are doing this on a prior CXL done uh, cornea and simultaneously doing CXL? So uh, there are reports as sir you suggested that your patients do it on a cross-linked eye already. So if you are doing it on a cross-linked eye that is not a absolute contraindication. But yes there are a few things you have to keep in mind is that this is a pre cross linked cornea the keratocytes and the fibroblasts which are going to be there are going to be different. So the, if you do a uh, laser on this eye the chances of haze or scar uh, is going to be different. Also, the outcomes might not be predicted because it's an already cross-linked eye. So, for example, I'm, achi I'm targeting to achieve 70% of correction. I might not always achieve 70% correction. Sometimes I can land up into an over or under correction. And there might be more chances of uh, prediction error here. And of course, uh, when if you're doing it on a pre-cross-linked eye, uh, there are literature which suggests that you should use mitomycin uh, in this eyes. You, traditionally, you would not use it, but if you are doing a laser on a cross-linked eye, you use mitomycin to prevent haze, is what I would suggest, but sir can add if he wants to. <laughs> I, I remember doing, you know, a study on that uh, because we did have a lot of patient post cross-linked uh, keratoconus eyes and we did TCAT for these patients. Uh, I waited for six months minimum for these patients yes. to stabilize not only the uh, characteristic uh, density wise for the ocular surface also and and the keratometry keeps changing after cross-linking and you're not sure what will be the final keratometry for these patients so minimum weight was six months for these patients then subsequently did uh, tcat and uh, some cases we succeeded to improve their you know wavefront but uh, you are right uh, it's, it's better to do a primary procedure than a secondary procedure possible nowadays uh, just a comment, I think very difficult topic that you have uh, addressed very well. But uh, what is your regimen for the post-operative treatment uh, in these patients? What so do you sir, treat them with and how long? 
So post pro surgery, uh, until the epithelium has healed, we only use antibiotic and uh, lubricating drops. However, surgeons across the globe do use steroids from the day one as well. But in our institute, we use uh, only antibiotics and lubricating till the epithelium has healed. And once the epithelium has healed, we remove the BCL and start steroid and cyclosporin. All our keratoconus patients do get uh, a cyclosporin for six months at least. Now, why cyclosporin is, uh, Ritika ma'am did mention that a lot of these patients do have ocular surface inflammation. And when you have ocular surface, in, surface inflammation, either you can land up into an excessive scarring post cross-linking or the cross-linking effect might fail, leading to progression in spite of doing a cross-linking. So, cyclosporin helps in reducing this inflammation in these cases and minimum use would be six months. So, we give steroids, uh, a high-dose steroid for one month followed by a low-dose steroid for two months and cyclosporin for all the cases and since, since past two years we have started using three halos based lubricating drop so initially we just used to use a no, normal sodium hyaluronate or a cmc drop but now since past three years we are using a three halo three halos based drop because that also reduces the inflammation so that is how our protocol is different from a normal uh, refractive surgery patient yeah um Okay, and uh, you know, um, studies have, uh, you mentioned that, that I think it should be clear to the audience that in some way when you're putting the eczema laser on the cornea and then doing cross-linking, there's a much higher incidence of haze. Now, uh, do you, have you felt the need to modify the protocol of cross-linking uh, and or which, uh, what protocol are you using uh, in these patients? So we are using an uh, accelerated protocol uh, where we do not modify anything but we use riboflavin drops 0.1% for 20 minutes, one drop every two minutes for 20 minutes, followed by which we use a UVA light of 9 millivolts per centimeter square for 10 minutes and we do not change this. We have not done the uh, dress, uh, the conventional protocol along with laser based cross linking because of the uh, eye will be exposed excessive for a longer time uh, with riboflavin drops and UVA light. So there can be more chances of haze. But we use accelerated protocol. We have started uh, after listening to you guys, mm. vitamin D and vitamin C, and also uh, a cold BCL after the procedure. Yes, ma'am. So we do listen to you. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Vitamin D does, again, along with cyclosporin, vitamin D also helps in reducing inflammation. And after COVID-19, I think everybody has started believing that vitamin D is very important. <laughs> That also all are using mitomycin C. No, uh, so if it's a case where we are doing a laser after cross linking, we use. But if it's a, a simultaneous case of laser and cross linking, no, because mitomycin helps in preventing haze. But if it's an inflamed eye like a keratoconus, on an inflamed eye, if you use mitomycin, it will lead to excessive activation of keratocytes and myofibroblasts. So there you have higher chances of developing haze. And Professor Shady Awad has already published this that in a cross, if you're doing a laser-based cross-linking, avoid using mitomycin to prevent excessive haze. So it's like a double-edged sword here. Dr. Bharti, sir, any comments? No, no, everything is... Okay. So you guys have asked everything. So that's fine. Thank you, Pooja. Wonderful you, uh, explanation and presentation. Keep doing a good work. Uh, before we go into a cataract surgery in keratoconus eyes, uh, we have, you know, another segment which may be an optical correction which is fakey eye wells. Unfortunately our uh, speaker is not here today, Dr. Gaurav could not make it to uh, this conference. So we have a panel of people, uh, we like to discuss that point because that's a very important, uh, you can say, uh, surgical aspect where people can do uh, commonly even those people who have no access to examine laser also or are in tax other things. So we have uh, options of her uh, doing fakey guiles. I will request, you know, Dr. Bharti sir to initiate uh, what all, what should be the, you know, cases where we should uh, feel you know, a fakey guile may be a good option for these cases, sir. So primarily... And you are free yeah. to ask question, you know, you are just sitting like that because I know that, you know... Uh, so primarily I think. feel in all those cases where uh, a good quality vision is possible with the glasses and um, there's a <coughs> issue with the high astigmatism or such things where uh, glasses are not acceptable because of certain reasons. Um, um, fake IOL is a good option. It's not an option where you need to put a contact lens to get a good vision. So, uh, 
and uh, majority of times what I personally uh, practice is cross link and then wait for at least one year. So I, I wait for one year for the cornea and the refraction to stabilize completely and then uh, measure and if even then if it is changing, the refraction is changing or the topography is changing or the pentacam reading is changing, then I would rather wait till uh, all these readings are uh, stable and refraction is stable and the pa patient can read well. And in those cases, uh, a fake IOL is a good, very good option. <coughs> In all those cases where uh, uh, there is an irregularity of cornea, uh, I think uh, 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 intracornial rings is a good option to make it regular and then wait for a while. And so what I have done is uh, I have done a cross-linking, but along with the cross-linking, I majority of times do uh, intracornial rings as well. And then let us, uh, I wait for about a year or so and before uh, going in for the second, uh, the third option, and that will be fake a Okay. Well, uh, thank you, sir, uh, for making this clear for the people here. Can I ask how many people uh, do uh, regular ICLs or a fake a here? Okay, there are uh, one or two people. But uh, you should understand that's also an option uh, for a correction in a difficult situation like keratoconus also. Uh, I'll ask Dr. Amit uh, to what parameters uh, we should look into because they are, they'll be totally different than a simple myopic patients, you know, because they have a deep AC and large diameter measuring white to white may be difficult sometimes. Any uh, special points there for uh, choosing the sizing of uh, fakey gar in these patients? Uh, yes, um, I totally agree. I mean, uh, when I'm Whenever I'm planning a uh, fakey guy, well, I like to take the reading myself uh, with the manual caliper uh, rather than just going in for, uh, and it has to corroborate with uh, other, like we have the NK nomogram with the uh, KSI2 swept source o o OCT. It has shown a very good correlation. And there was one talk by uh, uh, Reinstein and they were trying to uh, measure the ciliary body distance as a, uh, way to make it more predictable. Uh, I don't uh, have a very, very large experience. I'm a little conservative with putting in fake IOLs in keratoconus patients. We have an extremely good contact lens clinic, and I do believe that many patients can be counseled. That's my first effort, because the clarity of vision that they will get out of a contact lens is unmatched by any other means that you might go. So we spend a lot of time in trying to convince them for contact lenses, and I'm I might be more in favor of just using a non-toric fakic IOL in cases which have a high amount of like a myopic or a refractive error. Uh, I'm a bit conservative when it comes to an irregular cornea. You just don't know uh, how the patient is going to land up with, although there are very good publications. So I would be more keen uh, on putting in a, a ring segment and then probably going ahead with the and analyzing the fakey kaiwal. I'm sure other people have more experience than me in this. Madam sitting at Dr. Rupal then. So I agree with you. Uh, I've done only, I think, uh, uh, number that I can count on one hand itself. Uh, but the lo longest follow-up I have of an ICL put in a post-crosslink patient is for nine years now. And the patient is really doing well. Um, the uh, this patient, we waited for one and a half years before putting the ICL, and the cone was more central, uh, and we could p just put a normal ICL and not a toric one. And after that, and getting encouraged from that, I have put several others, and I would do it uh, in patients in whom, as uh, uh, Dr. Rightly pointed out, uh, in patients in whom you can easily uh, give good, best corrected vision with spectacles. Thank you. I think the, there is a point. Uh, as Dr. Bharti was saying, you know, sometimes this is not the surgery to correct everything because the disease is in, in cornea. It's not into the you know, uh, optical uh, refractive uh, device which is beyond the cornea. So after putting this uh, ICL also, you may require to do a patch up. And there, I think you have an option of doing a surface ablation intact. So many things can be combined. 
So it is a one way to decrease the, you know, the load of uh, refractive error and do some other procedure. Yeah, Pooja, you wanted to say something? So I just want to ask and comment. No, no, you can't ask. You have to comment only. <laughs> I was quite immature at that time. Uh, and there was a patient who was uh, who got cross-linked when he was a child, but when he became 21, he came for uh, ICL. Uh, and I actually neglected the history of scleral contact lens wear in him. He had worn scleral contact lenses for almost five years. And uh, But when I went ahead and did the fakicarial, so as Sir mentioned, he was extremely unhappy. Uh, so one point I think which I learned from that case is if the patients have worn lenses, scleral lenses or even RGP, I think just avoid doing fakey or uh, tell, I tell them if they're very, very, very keen, first de-counsel them, but if they're very, very keen, I ask them to wear glasses for six, three months at least, see how they are and if they're happy then come back because as Sir mentioned, it's to reduce the refractive error load and sometimes patients are tired of contact lenses. but. They, they forget the part that they're going to be unhappy after surgery. So I, that one first case of uh, ICL in KC was the biggest uh, lesson I think I had. Okay, thank you, Pooja. I think this is one point is very clear. We learned so many things from the patients, you know. They are the actual teachers and uh, you might read so many things, but application, the outcome is going to be told by the patient. So we should learn from the patient's point of view, patient's symptoms, the corrections, the achievements the daily activities, those things are going to make us more uh, wiser and we try to correct those subsequently also. So we should respect the patient as I know teachers for us and th if they are there, we're going to learn so many things. Thank you, Pooja. Now, yeah, Ritika, please. only wearing spectacles, never tried contact lenses, they are happier with ICL because the minification goes away. Yeah. So they actually gain a line. Two important things you must keep in mind, the white to white is for normal eyes, the same normogram doesn't work. So you will have, you may have some sizing issues. And sometimes when you're doing a toric, you prefer a higher size than a lower size because you don't want it to rotate. Because a lower vault will cause a toric to rotate. And you feel that you have a deep AC, so you can go for a high vault. That is, again, a wrong idea, because it's only the central AC that is deep. The peripheral AC is still shallow. So don't think that this deep AC gives you the leverage to really go on the upside of the vault. Yeah, very good point, very good point. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so uh, one thing, one thing I wanted to, you know, say about Ritika said was, whenever the AC depth is more than 3.4, I take the ICL of one size more, one size up. So, uh, to just to make it sure that uh, it is not rotating and it is not undersized. So that's I think my take, and I think I have been successful in using a one step higher uh, ICL in all these cases when there is a cutoff. If it is less than 3.4, I don't, I don't uh, meddle with the, uh, you know, sizing. So that is, I think that is very important. Yeah, we have a question, Hello. sir. Uh, my routine <laughs> statement to my patients with high power is that glasses are the best, second best is laser, and worst alternative, not the third best, are contact lenses. I want, I need a modification from the dice. So, should I continue with this statement? No, or no. As, somebody is a contact no, as, contact as we, we talked the about, there are cases where contact lenses are only alternative to have a quality of vision. In that, the corneal ectectic disorders is the yes. number one. Yes, right. There, you have no other options. Exactly. So, contact lenses are the best option, especially now in, in this era where you have a semi scleral contact lenses. They do a wonderful job for a all types of contact, uh, keratoconus cases. So that's a primary choice for us. Only problem comes when the patient is intolerant. There then we have to think of all these areas to decrease the, you know, the burden of a thick uh, glasses because that's not going to improve vision at all. But even those cases where we are intolerant to RGP lenses like rose gate lenses, if you shift to a semi scleral contact lenses, they do a wonderful for these patients. So that is one alternative. For a simple high myopia where ectasia is not there, there I think faking IL should be the choice because that gives you a very good uh, refractive correction because cornea is normal, not aberrated. So you'll always achieve a good uh, quality of vision, sir. 
Thank you. Yeah. And anisometric rupee again yeah, yeah. contact lens would be the only thing. Choice. You know. Actually, yeah. with the contact lens, you start with yearly contact lens. Then you come for the monthly, no, no, weekly, no, no, no. and daily. We are not talking about. We are talking about corneal Ectasia. lenses Ectasia. and also gas permeable hard lenses. Yeah. We're not talking about soft lenses at all. We're talking there about. You, there you are right. Glasses will be the best option <laughs> there. Yeah. Even normal. When we are talking about Ectasia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm wearing glasses, you know. <laughs> what about the second best option? <laughs> His question was, what is the second best option? He prefers refractive surgery over contact lens for high refractive error. No, no, for high refractive error, you know, then you have a fake eye with a better choice. P in fact, fake eye is so good now, even people are doing for mild to moderate uh, myopia also. Because the quality is, why should I damage my cornea if something else can be done? If it, if it is safe enough. So we see now with the new uh, generation, uh, uh, these uh, lenses, fake gyal, the complications are hardly there. And surgical techniques have improved so much in terms of our sizing wise, the accuracy is better. So I think people should learn fake gyal. Okay, thank you. Now let's shift to the cataract part because this is a s session where we had a both cataract refractive and keratoconus does give a challenge for a cataract surgery as such. And uh, we have Dr. Manpreet Kaur, she's the assistant professor in RP Center in the cornea refractive is, uh, segment. And she's the one who made this program. And uh, thank you, Manpreet, for involving all of us. Thank and you can you, st deliver your talk. Thank you, sir. So I'll be talking on biometry and IL selection in cataract with keratoconus, no financial disclosures. So we may choose not to do a surface ablation in a patient with keratoconus. We may choose not to go ahead with a fake acyl implantation, but cataract we cannot escape. We all will face cases that have keratoconus and cataract. In fact, they have a greater likelihood of development of cataract at a younger age because of associated atopy, steroid use because of associated vernal keratoconjunctivitis, senile cataract per se is an issue in itself. So there is a stepwise approach when you see a patient of keratoconus with cataract. First establish the diagnosis. Is the blurred vision due to keratoconus or cataract? So do a contact lens over refraction. Do not be in a hasty to treat a mild cataract that can be corrected with contact lens or spectacles alone. Document stability. Determine if the keratoconus is stable or progressive. So you need to have serial topography examinations. Third step is counsel. Again, the patient should have realistic expectations. It is in fact going to reduce the magnitude of the refractive error, not eliminate it completely. So the outcomes that they may see after cataract surgery in their relatives, etc. may not apply to them. Then you come to biometry, IL power calculation and IL selection. What you have to remember is there is a tendency towards post-operative hyperopia, whichever formula you use, whichever keratometry device you use. So what are the challenges in accurate biometry and IL power calculation? The axial length estimation, keratometry, effective lens position estimation, and the formula errors. So before you proceed with biometry, the timing of biometry is very important. A lot of these patients will be using contact lens. You ha have to uh, take into account the contact lens induced corneal warpage. So for soft contact lens, they should be off contact lenses for one week before you proceed with measurements. For RGP hybrid or toric lenses, two weeks. For scleral lenses that do not touch the cornea, two to three, three days is said to be enough. We do take these into account when you're doing refractive planning. We conveniently ignore it when we are doing biometry for cataract. It's as important, the timing of biometry while doing cataract surgery. Axial length, keratoconus is associated with axial elongation and myopia. In fact, the axial length has been observed to have a stronger correlation of the final spherical equivalent than the preoperative K readings in keratoconus patients. So it's more important than keratometry, not less so. A decentered apex in keratoconus, the visual axis estimation may be uncertain and challenging. So what we have seen is ultrasonic biometry is often inaccurate. Optical biometry is the preferred modality as the visual axis determination is more accurate. Then coming to the keratometry challenges. You have the index of refraction error, instrument error, formula error, and irregular T of film. So index of refraction error, the conventional keratometers are based on assuming a fixed anterior to posterior corneal curvature ratio and the standard keratometric index of 1.3375 is used to 
calculate the keratometry. It does not hold true in keratoconus. The anterior to posterior corneal curvature ratio is altered. Second, the keratometers are inaccurate as the asymmetry of corneal curvature is do not, not taken into account. You have irregular astigmatism. Visual axis and corneal apex may not coincide. Formula error because a lot of the newer regression formulas are based on effective lens position calculation which is inaccurate because of a much deeper anterior chamber depth, a higher axial length and steep corneas and again the visual axis and the apex do not coincide. Irregular tear film limit the repeatability of corneal curvature measurements. So all these errors you should take into account. So which keratometry device to use? Manual keratometry and automated keratometry have a low reliability. The preferred modalities again are optical biometry and corneal tomography. In fact, with the newer tomographical devices, you get the true net par maps, equivalent K readings. What they do is take into account both the anterior and posterior corneal surfaces while calculating the post uh, keratometry. So a keratometry is always going to be overestimated in cases of keratoconus. So as you can see, this is just an equivalent K reading report that we have observed in Pentacam. So what studies have shown is that 4.5 mm is the best zone to take the keratometry for more accurate readings. So it will calculate the flat and steep K and you can in fact select the zone also in which you want to take the K readings. So this is how the vertex and pupil centric readings changes. So this is a corneal power distribution map. So same patient, same eye. These are the readings centered on the vertex and the lower ones are centered on the pupil. So as you can see, if you see the true net par, taking into account both the posterior and corneal curvature at around 3 mm, it's 49.5 if it's centered on the vertex and 47.1 if it's centered on the pupil. So you have to go towards more pupil centric pars in keratoconus. Okay, so the K is less. So the post-op hyperopia is going to be less when you're going to take these pupil centric readings. So as you can see here, and again, this true net par is much lower than the simple keratometry. So that is why you have to take into account both the anterior and posterior corneal curvatures to avoid an overestimation of keratometry and a postoperative hyperopic surprise. So you can also shift the zone in which you can uh, you want to calculate the keratometry. You can edit the size of the calculation zone to get a better keratometry reading. So Various studies have observed that from mild keratoconus and moderate keratoconus, mild less than 48 and 48 to 55, they have defined as moderate. You use the actual keratometry that you obtain with either your biometers or your topographical devices. So what you get is 60% within plus minus one diopter in cases of mild keratoconus and 41.9% cases within plus minus one diopter. Much less than what you get in normal senile cataract, but still this is in the acceptable range. In cases of advanced keratoconus, more than 55 diopter, nothing works. So a standard K of 43.5 diopter has in fact found to perform better than taking all these advanced keratometry readings. Formula. All formulas result in post-operative hyperopia. That is rule number one. So target for a post-op myopia. So for a mild keratoconus less than 47 diopter, a lot of formulas, formulas work well. Different studies say some say SRK2, Hopper Q, Holiday with K adjustment, SRKT. SRK2 and SRKT both have been seen to work well. Even Barrett Universal works well. Target a myopia for at least minus one diopter. When you're moving more towards 47 to 50 diopters, moderate keratoconus, go for SRKT. Target a myopia of minus 1.5 diopter. More than 50 diopter as the K increases, all formulas become unpredictable. Large post-operative hyperopia may be seen. SRKT is still the formula to go with as per different studies Barrett Universal works well the literature is limited on that as of now avoid using the actual case standard K may be better target for a more higher degree of post of myopia minus 1.82 diopters so this is a study by Savini et al they evaluated the predictability of five different tile power calculation formula and they gave the prediction error of plus minus 0.5 diopter. So what they observed was that with SRKT, 61.9% of stage 1 keratoconus were within plus minus 0.5. And this was much higher than Barrett or Holiday. Both of them were inferior as compared to SRKT in this study. So which I will now to choose. So you 
should go ahead with monofocal intraocular lenses for a majority of cases toric eyes need careful patient selection again realistic expectations you are going to reduce the magnitude of corneal cylinder you may not completely eliminate it you have to document stability the case should be stable in successive readings the axis and the magnitude both especially the axis stability have to be documented explain the need for post op visual rehabilitation spectacles contact lenses will still be required multifocal eyes as far as multifocal eyes are concerned you should not implant so this is just a case example a 35 year old female came with both eye advanced keratoconus with intumescent cataract stable no progression so optical biometry we were unable to capture because it was a white cataract axial length was done with an immersion a scan keratometry pentacam readings were taken right eye phaco emulsification with il was put Minus one diopter expand series intraocular lens was put in the right eye. Target myopia was of minus one point three six degree diopters. Postoperative uncorrected visual acuity was six twenty four parts. Refraction was plus three point five diopter sphere with minus four diopter cylinder at one zero three. So there was a post op hyperopia. This is another case. A nineteen year old male, both eye keratoconus with dense PSC, stable, no progression. It was a mild keratoconus case, so we went ahead with toric implantation in both eye. The cylinder, the maximum T nine, what it could offer was. Uh, the cylinder was beyond the range of correction of toric eye and customized toric the patient was not affording in which we could have gone for even higher cylinders so in the right eye the uncorrected distance visual acuity was 69 in the left eye the uncorrected distance visual acuity was 618 corrected spectacle corrected was 612 so we could reduce the magnitude of cylinder and the visual quality and acuity both were acceptable to the patient of course we could not completely eliminate the cylinder in this cases premium eyes as i was saying in hand monofocal intermediate visual acuity extended range of vision eyes multifocal eyes at least the patient with mild keratoconus will try to push for it that why cannot we have spectacle independence please do not go ahead with these lenses they'll induce further aberrations in an already aberrated keratoconic cornea just to conclude axial length is longer than usual optical biometry should be preferred keratometry the devices will overestimate the k use topography devices and optical biometers for mild to moderate keratoconus for advanced keratoconus use standard k il par you will have post op hyperopia so target myopia more with increasing severity of keratoconus srk t barrett universal 2 kane keratoconus formula all have been found to be fairly reliable il type go for monofocal toric il in mild to moderate stable disease avoid multifocal document the stability of disease counsel well and go counsel for post op visual rehabilitation and there is no one size fits all please customize as per your patient requirements thank you thank you thank you manpreet uh, for highlighting this let's go to the surgical aspect request dr parful uh, to take us to the difficulty challenges in doing a phaco in uh, these patients dr parful has been a part of making this program and uh, in fact uh, they've got a good session made okay. thank you sir uh, for that kind introduction so i'll be dealing with surgical challenges done that one may encounter while doing cataract surgery in a patient of uh, keratoconus or other form of corneal ectasia the major challenge in such cases is biometry and il selection which dr mantu has covered so nicely During surgery, there are three main issue. Three main issues. First is uh, visualization. Why? Because the cornea is irregular. At times, you there could be scar because of healed hydrops or subepithelial scarring. So visualization is a big problem. The most important part that I feel is depth perception. It gives you false depth. So that is a, a bit tricky while doing uh, uh, your posterior capsular polishing. The second part is wound creation. So you are dealing with a cornea which is inherently weak. so the uh, location of your incision uh, can impact the final post op outcome it can induce a astigmatism unwanted astigmatism the wound may not seal and all this problem may be there with clear corneal incision that we most of we are accustomed with phaco emulsification is not different from routine cataract surgery but one problem is the inter chamber volume is too high too big so uh, i will show you in video what really happens when we are doing phaco emulsification this was a case of keratoconus as you as i just highlighted clear corneal incision has so many issues so it's better to go for limbal or cornea scleral or even few surgeons they uh, do scleral tunnel and then do phaco emulsification so limbal incision this is what i prefer 
and uh, routine you routine uh, steps like injecting air uh, trypan glue should be there because why the visibility part can be taken care of by using trypan glue it improves the contrast and it will help you in rexes and also while taking doing cortical aspiration if your fico or ia probe is near the cone area then that rexes margin may not be that apparent so that will help you in that the second part is uh, whether to use cystitome or capsular rexes for set if you notice here the moment my instrument is going beneath the cone there is a distortion so uh, it's better to use capsular rexes for steps why because you can follow the arc and complete it uh, complete your rexes with cystitome there may be little bit difficulty because needle is fine structure and beneath that cone there may be distortion and you may not appreciate the depth appropriately rest of the steps are uh, like a routine cataract surgery but do all these steps little bit gently and uh, this is the problem that i i was uh, telling about the moment you start your irrigation on the pupil dilates and as if the ch enter chamber depth has significantly increased that you will get that feeling so to avoid that you can lower your bottle height and you can select a iop which is on lower side this is another issues with uh, keratoconus patients because you tend to go a little bit posterior while making incision you can have conjunctival ballooning while uh, operating uh, doing phaco emulsification so you can make few nicks with your mbr knife or conjunctival scissor to get rid of that another problem is since the volume is big the nuclear pieces they tend to uh, run uh, run off from your phaco probe so what you can do is you can inject viscoelastic and achieve a little bit pseudo cushion and then complete your phaco emulsification nuclear grade is usually on softer side in this cases because these patients usually present early so that uh, phaco emulsion part is not difficult iol insertion is similar to your routine cases but yes you can get some hidden pieces lying here and there so when you are doing irrigation aspiration at the end of the procedure so do it little bit longer compared to your routine cases so that all these hidden pieces are taken care of the second scenario is when there is some opacity here it was a case of keratoconus along with uh, pellucid marginal cordial degeneration with a heel hydros but fortunately the scar is uh, of the visual axis so that was not a big problem but remember when you are doing corneal or clear corneal or limbal incision in a scarred cornea the amount of astigmatism that you may induce much uh, larger compared to a routine cornea so you should avoid the scarring area however if it is inevitable always try to go perpendicular to the location of the scar if you are making incision uh, near that then rexes all this thing as i showed in your previous video it's like uh, always strain the capsule and uh, use uh, uh, capsular rexes forceps if possible so the problem with visualization you can take care of by this three this is just a summary of these two videos use viscoelastic to coat the corneal surface why because viscoelastic will prevent your epithelial dehydration during the procedure and also they will give you some little magnification of intraocular contents trypan blue you should always use it will help you in rexes as well as during irrigation aspiration rgp there is a uh, this uh, oe et al they have published this series where they have used uh, rgp lens during cataract surgery and if you notice this picture this is a picture with uh, contact lens you can see the enter capsule is clearly apparent here there is some distortion of the enter capsule so if you use a rgp lens during surgery that can improve your visibility corneal incision you should always avoid corneal incision always go for a limbal or corneal scleral incision avoid scarring areas and always try to put a suture if you are little bit doubtful about the self sealing nature of the corneal incision and if your patient is uh, not happy with suture you can put a drop of fibrin glue at the end of the procedure this is a nomogram dr manpreet has already covered this uh, quite nicely how to choose so ensure that the patient is having a stable keratoconus and one other important thing is a history of good preoperative corrected distance visual equity so i'll just give you one example this is this is what i uh, have encountered in my uh, uh, setup so one kid was referred to me for cataract surgery under general anesthesia why because the surgeon they didn't have general ga setup for cataract surgery so when i see the patient there was a little bit cortical cataract yes the patient had keratoconus the cataract was not that significant but if you see the patient carefully he has all the characteristic features of lorenz moon bidel syndrome there is truncal obesity there is short and stubby fingers of course on pentagram there was keratoconus but 
if you see the left eye, the cortical, where the cortical cataract, the, there is complete uh, pallor of the optic disc. So, loss of vision in that kid was not because of keratoconus with cataract, that, but, but it was due to the optic atrophy, associated optic atrophy. So, whenever you are planning cataract surgery in patients with keratoconus, always ensure that the patient had, at some point of time, good corrected distance visual equity. And uh, this is a new IOL that I just came across while reviewing the literature. The North et al, they have discussed, described this IOL used in keratoconus patients. It's a small aperture IOL where there is a ring of pigmentation from uh, 1.23 mm to 3.23 mm. The hypothesis is that it will prevent all the peripherally scattered light uh, to enter into and reach the retina. It will only allow the centrally focused rays to reach your retina. And the initial result, they are claiming good, but I think we need more studies on this. With this, I would like to conclude here. I would like to acknowledge Professor Namta Sharma and Dr. Priyadarshini for helping me in this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Parful. Uh, uh, very nice presentation. Both uh, Manpreet and Parful have taken us through the cataract part so effectively. I think uh, we have no questions on that part. And uh, any question from the house, we would like to answer. And towards the end, I'd like to make an announcement like it is done in uh, aeroplanes, like we are finished before time. <laughs> and have a good lunch. The Thank only you. thing I uh, was about to comment was that this small aperture IOL is now being used in the US as a routine. Mm -hmm. And they find it excellent in all those cases of uh, keratoconus and radial keratotomy. And I think uh, uh, if we practice, uh, I have done in a few cases, and if we practice that uh, pupiloplasty, what Amar has, you know, advocated, that is also a good idea, as long as you can do it without much damage. Yeah. The only, only problem there is, you know, uh, I'm not sure, like, I had had one patient uh, which was done in uh, Chennai, and patient had a you know, detachment subsequently. It was post-traumatic uh, metriasis and uh, traumatic cataract. They managed well, but patient had a detachment, and ultimately it has to be reopened, and the pupil never came back. So this so this is possible in this IOL as well? Huh, IOL, at least you can dilate the pupil and see in the periphery. Thank you, Bharti, sir. <laughs> Thank you, and wish you all the best. Have a good yeah. No, it's not there yet. No, no, it's not. Very soon, the uh, Indian company will make it, don't worry. <laughs> we'll have a group photograph with all the speakers and panelists. Yes,